Harvard Divinity School. 2023 Ankuk Lecture on Korean Buddhism. Wearing Divine Protection. The Funerary Use of the 24 Buddhist Talismans in Chozon, Korea with Su Jung Kim. February 6th, 2023. My name is Charles Stang, and I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. Welcome to this evening's event, the annual Ankuk Lecture in Korean Buddhism. We're very excited to resume this annual lecture series, which has been in hiatus since the pandemic disrupted our in-person programming. And so we're especially excited to welcome this evening's speaker, Professor Sujin Kim, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at DePaul University. Sujung specializes in Japanese and Korean Buddhism and is interested in tracing the interaction between Buddhist cultures using textual and material sources in their East Asian context. Her first book was entitled Shinra Myojin and Buddhist Networks of the East Asian Mediterranean. It came out from the University of Hawaii in 2019, and it explores how the deity Shinra Myojin is not only an influential protector god of the Anjoji Temple in Japan, apologies if I mispronounced that, but also part of the transnational network of people, ideas, and gods spanning China, Korea, and Japan. Currently, Su Zhong is working on her second book entitled Korean Magical Medicine, Buddhist Healing Talismans in Chosun, Korea, in which she investigates the religious, historical, and iconic dimensions of healing talismans produced in Buddhist settings during the Chosun period between 1392 and 1910. Although its primary focus is Korean talismans, the book also locates itself in the broader East Asian contexts, aiming at showing the complex web of talismanic culture in East Asia. In this evening's lecture, Sojong will offer us a glimpse into this exciting new book project. Uh, let me say that the center's next event is this Thursday, February 9th at 5.30. It will be the first, in uh, the first event in our newly revived series on psychedelics and the future of religion. I will be in conversation with uh, Frederica Apfel Marglin and Randy Chung Gonzalez about their new co-authored book entitled Initiated by the Spirits, Healing the Ills of Modernity Through Shamanism, Psychedelics, and the Power of the Sacred. As always, the best way to stay abreast of what we're doing here at the center and its programming is to sign up for our weekly newsletter. So this is how the evening will unfold. I will soon disappear and Su Zhang will appear to give her talk. When she's done, I will reappear to help manage the Q&A from the audience. So without further ado, uh, Su Zhang, uh, I invite you uh, to, there you are, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for a nice introduction, Charlie. And also thank you so much for um, special thanks for uh, Matt Dillon, <clears throat> who is currently at the, the Institute, uh, Center for the Study of World Religions here at uh, Harvard University. So my name is Su Jung Kim, and I'm going to give you uh, um, my lecture in a minute. Here is my PowerPoint that I'm going to share my screen now. I hope everyone sees it. Um, okay, so <laughs> thank you, Charlie. So um, I titled uh, my talk um, "Wearing Divine Protection." Actually, the divine. When I was thinking about the title, I uh, got the inspiration from Charlie's book. So that's why I have "divine" in the middle. So. Um, the subtitle is The Funerary Use of the 24 Buddhist Talismans in Joseon, Korea. I'm going to start with this um, groomy and very um, um, difficult concept, death, right? When we think about or encounter or even just, you know, any feeling of this uh, concept, death, uh, we have a lot of emotions, we have very often negative response to it, and this uncanniness of this um, that we as a human cannot avoid, right? And 
I thought I'd like to start with this image. Uh, I don't know, some of you may have seen this is a um, new movie just came out. It's available on Netflix called White Noise. It's off the wall, humor, black comedy. And here the scene depicts very dramatic portrayal of the fear, how death um, feels like to most of us. So Adam Drive, the main character of this movie is driving a car in the water and they are just facing to the waterfall now. So let me start with this idea of death in a more scholarly, uh, more analytical uh, way. So in um, sociology and anthropology, a lot of um, people had this idea of how we cope with how we manage death and often what happens after death is a funeral it's a ritual people go through this ritual regardless of time and space in human history so a famous scholar in anthropology uh, called Arnold van Gennep once uh, he tried to think about or theorize this idea of ritual how it the structure looks like. According to him, it says separation, first stage, there are three uh, part stages, and first it's a separation, and then liminality, somehow like limbo state status, and then finally incorporation, or sometimes you can call it reintegration. So you come back to the where you departed, but you actually by through going through the ritual, ritual transports you, you kind of come back, but not, not the same place, you are um, elevated, or you go through different, um, you are back to the different realm. So death rituals are designed to go through a cycle of ordinary life to extra, extraordinary loss, and back again to the realm of the mundane. Um, when it comes to funeral or death in Buddhism, although some cultures like Japanese Buddhism, um, funeral aspects of Buddhism has been um, somewhat uh, explored by scholars, but um, Korean Buddhism, where I'm very interested in uh, for my second book project, um, this aspect has been very limited, uh, um, limitedly understood. So this talk, I'm going to uh, explain to you the main gist, the main takeaway of this today's lecture is talismans were the one of the major prominent uh, material aid that Chosun Buddhists were relied on. So this is the main uh, point that I like to make through my different uh, examples. For instance, these are sort of two prominent examples. There are so many other examples that, that I'm going to introduce you in a minute, but these are the two examples that I like to um, mention first. One is uh, left one, left side, you see talisman for rebirth in the Pure Land. Um, so basically this talisman has long history um, starting from um, medieval China, but this talisman guarantees your rebirth in uh, Pure Land. Basically, if you do not know Buddhist doctrine, don't worry, but basically similar to Christian heaven in Buddhism, uh, people imagined after you die, there is another life. You, re, re, you rebirth, unlike Christianity, of course, you rebirth. But the best bet for you is to rebirth in um, this amazing paradise, Western paradise called Pure Land. Um, so that was one major um, talisman that chosen people also really in, um, embraced. On the right hand side, sorry for the blurred image, but basically this is another very popularly used talisman, talisman for destroying hell and reborn in the pure land. Same idea of rebirth in the pure land, but also they don't want you to fall into the hell. In Buddhism, um, similar to Dante's, you know, there are so many different um, uh, layers of or realms of uh, hells. So this is something that tells us what people concerned when they facing um, death. So in my new book that I'm um, sort of halfway, more than halfway done, 
I titled uh, Korean Magical Medicine. So this book uh, basically came out of the pandemic. <laughs> During the pan when pandemic hit, you know, everyone's mind is captured and capti captivated by this idea of fear of death right basically what we really fear during the pandemic was fear of death eventually your death or your loved one's death right so i thought how about pre-modern period in korea um especially joseon period where there are so many materials data are left but for some um, interesting reasons, there has been no English book on Joseon period Korean Buddhism. There is one book on Three Kingdoms period, uh, which is the most sort of ancient part of Korean history, Buddhist history. But then there's Goryeo period, which is 10th to um, 14th century. There is one book. There is um, this era, Joseon era from 14th century to early 20th century over 600 years Buddhist history, we do not have any book. So I thought maybe I should write one. So, and also I wanted to know how people before there was, um, before prior to, you know, doctors and hospitals, how people coped with this everyday problem, which is being sick and dying. So this is the book that I like to explore those everyday um, use of talismans, but in the Buddhist setting, um, and how Joseon people, especially non elites people, try to um, cope with these uh, fears and desires in everyday life. So, um, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm just skipping a lot here. So this is the outline for today's talk. I'm starting with what talisman is, and then I will introduce some historical background, and then I will give you some more visual examples, specific examples, and then I will give you some broader um, considerations, and then I will conclude. So um, I'm showing you a very... Um, um, not necessarily typical, but in Joseon period, this elite called Yangban. Yangban has this, his own, uh, Yangban is his class name, um, often hired by the court. They follow neo Confucian values during the Joseon period. And this is um, the Yangban, male Yangban, Yangban's uh, library. So what we see here is different things, different objects. Um, I'm sort of introducing different what, where you can find talismans in everyday space. So here, one example uh, that you see on this side is the um, uh, folding screens people use for decoration or for rituals, various reasons, just partition. They use these folding screens and you see a lot of talismans. When talismans were drawn on these folding screens, it is often bringing good luck. So different um, kinds of talismans are depicted here. On the left, what you see is a little pouch. People may have car carried this. So what you see closely in the middle is this uh, yellow paper has red ink, some difficult to read, but basically uh, talismanic scripts are written on this little paper and very likely you carry it, um, that pouch wherever you go so that you get the 24 seven protection. This is another typical um, talisman that you would see encounter if you went back to, you took a you know, time machine and go back to Joseon, then very likely encounter this. And here we have even Korean characters here, right? Like Mansa Daegil, which is everything goes well, or Akki Bulchim, which means no evil spirits coming in. What is very interesting about this particular one is um, this is called Three Calamities um, Talisman in Korean Samje Bujok. So basically, Koreans thought that there are some three years, you, everyone goes through this uh, cycle of some misfortunate three years in your life. So when you have this talisman, those um, um, misfortunes will go away. And... This is another example. You see, um, there are some furniture. So I thought maybe I can show you some a small table that people use in everyday space. And what you see on the surface is the talisman. Different talismans were 
um, inscribed. So basically, my point here is that um, you see talismans everywhere in chosen periods. Everyone may have had one. And even now, actually, even you are Christians or even the Korean recently uh, um, uh, erect, elected a uh, Korean president, Mr. Yoon, he once had a political scandal um, during his campaign because he apparently wrote something on his palm, maybe um, some, you know, with some hope that that makes him to the next president. And he became the president, so maybe it really worked. Now you are looking at um, somebody's coffin. <laughs> this is the 14th, uh, 15th century Confucian scholar politician's tomb. So recently, um, yeah, in 2009, um, this tomb was excavated. And what you see is the inside of this uh, wooden uh, coffin. Um, sorry for those people who do not read Koreans, but I'm going to translate for you. Here are same Daran um, talismans here on the so basically what you see is the eastern uh, eastern western um, southern and northern direction and basically your the uh, corpse should have lied on this the head lies here and then what you see is the talismans here and this talisman is the three calamities talisman that we just learned and there are some other uh, auspicious animals drawn here the close shot of this talisman that you see um, is this different things going on here, but what I'm mainly interested in is this kind of Chinese character based talismans that I'm going to explain why people use this and what are they and what is written and how these things all together function. So talisman, I kept talking about talisman, talisman, but I'd like to maybe uh, briefly define what I mean by talisman. Talisman is a translation of uh, this pre-modern term um, in Korean, bu, or sometimes in pre-modern sources, they call it bu in or sometimes in. So there's no actually one term to translate this pre-modern um, words or concepts. But most modern Korean um, people, they would be more familiar with this term called pujok. So, um, but know that um, pujok is actually a coined term in the uh, in the 1970s. So it's uh, not the you know a historical term, but I'm using this talisman to as a translation of pu puin and also pujok. Broadly defined, um, I define talisman as any tangible objects believed to hold magical properties and powers. It can be anything really, but for my book, I like to focus on one particular type of talisman because think about my interest in non-elites uh, devotionalism. Often what was available to them was the cheapest, most available um, material, which was paper in um, the Joseon time period. So in my book, I'm mostly um, ex examining paper talismans, so two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional um, talismans. So um, how talismans work? Um, roughly, you can say that there are two functions. One is to bringing um, protecting the beholders from negative influences. So basically you want to get rid of evil influences coming from outside to inside. So basically you want to protect yourself. The other thing is you also bring in, bringing the beholders, the positive influences. So you want to take lots of good uh, vibes or good influences, good luck, but also you want to get rid of um, negative influences. So there are, this is two directional movements, right? One is inward, the other is out, out, uh, outward. So some of you may have this question, how to make talismans? I've seen YouTube you know, videos, some people teach you how to make talismans. So what about in the pre-modern time period? How do you make it? How do you sacralize it um, too? You know? So traditionally, uh, talismans was um, the making 
was a very highly elaborated uh, ritualized act. You, you require a lot of knowledge, but there's a lot of uh, specially prepared materials. So just think about ink. You already now get some idea of red ink was used, but the redness comes from mostly from this uh, mineral called cinnabar. Cinnabar um, is a very interesting material. It has very fluid um, shape. It can easily go between uh, liquid form to solid form. So in ancient China, uh, often people believe that cinnabar is the, um, the key of uh, mortality. So a lot of emperors, for instance, in Chinese history, they consumed it and died of it. Um, because if you eat it too much, it kills you. And sometimes people use other redness like blood or sometimes often cinnabar could be also expensive. So a lot of uh, ordinary people, they preferred other um, ink such as black ink. And also, well, of course, uh, you know, um, the rich people could use even gold. Um, sometimes, so there are a lot of healing talismans that I'm more interested in, and for to maximize their healing uh, power, sometimes they even use herbal uh, decoctions to as a you know way to draw these talismanic uh, scripts, and they also was very. Um, particular about papers. So fine papers, often strips of yellow and white paper. Yellow is also interesting because yellow was particularly chosen because in Chinese um, ancient thinking, there is this yin and yang and yellow is uh, lots of yang energy, bright, you know, sort of rising energy so that they thought this is the best um, color. And sometimes um, to make yellow color paper, people also use some herbal uh, materials to dye the white paper. So consuming it was also part of very typical procedure of, um, you know, uh, get healed through healing talismans. And so in my other chapter, um, I'm sort of um, also arguing that just consuming talisman after you draw and then do some rituals and then uh, incinerate and then consume the um, ashes may seem to be a superstitious act, but actually there are some many layers of um, medical concerns built in. So that's kind of a little bit broader, um, but also a little bit more interesting aspects of making a material aspects of talisman. As I just briefly said, uh, we need some rituals to activate. So the beholder has to sort of different, going through different rituals, such as visualizing, chanting, and breathing sometimes to maximize the celestial impact in the talismans. Um, in Buddhism, they had a little bit more um, clearly defined structure. So talisman is definitely one sort of um, one layer to summon gods. Basically what you are doing here is uh, using this talismanic um, script, you summon, you call, right, the, the um, deities that you need and ask them to do certain things. And in Buddhism, um, similar to other Indian religions, um, there is such a thing called dharani. Dharani is a Sanskrit word meaning um, incantation or the original etymology is to hold, to remember. But it's a short phrases Often you do not know what it means, but people believe that the, the utterance, the, the saying of that sound has sacred power. So people often uh, use the talisman and dharani together. Some um, on rare cases, we also see the another one more layer to activate talismanic power, which was mudra. Mudra is another Sanskrit term meaning hand gestures. So if you go to see Buddhist uh, icons, you know they have a lot of different you know hand gestures like this, right? And those are mudras. And um, not so much I could find examples in chosen uh, example talismanic uh, practice, but it was used, particular mudra was used to activate particular types of talisman. Now, I'd like to move on to the historical um, transmission. 
So before we go to the Korea, um, we have to sort of understand this East Asia as a more broader cultural unit. A lot of um, cultural interactions happen between Korea, Japan, China, um, Japan, China as well. But um, in terms of talismanic transmission, often China was the main source for Koreans um, to um, receive it. And then also there was some local adaptations as well. We do not know much about talismanic culture before this period called the Korea period. Um, but what I can confidently say is that individually from different uh, routes, um, these talismans were circulated, uh, introduced and circulated to Korea. And the topic of today's talk, which is there are so many different talismans, so I cannot really explain everything, but I'm focusing on one this uh, one uh, type of talisman, which is 24 talismans. So this talisman is actually the collection of every popular talisman combined. So that probably happened, it's my estimation, sometime in the late Joseon period. So if you're not familiar with the Joseon history, often scholars divide Joseon like uh, the early Joseon and late Joseon. So there was 16th century, we had a war with Japan. So that is sort of dividing point. So roughly 16th, 17th century, these 24 were collected. And this is what I'm going to talk about more, how they come from and how they, you know, made that um, um, big giant uh, talisman. So what I like to argue here is that this talisman, once it was combined, it was uh, functioned as a one giant talisman communicating a complex vision and comprehensive benefits. So to get to 24, actually, we have several examples building up. We have some 12, 14, 18, and eventually we see 24. So I'm going to show you that sort of that pattern from uh, Korea period. So here we have very small um, uh, gilt bronze straw box. Um, judging from the material, you see, um, and the very elaborate nature, um, this may have been a uh, belong to a upper class person. So we actually know the, the owner, Lady O. And in it, what you find is this folded small, very small um, scripture. Um, and it has some Dharani um, in both Chinese and uh, Siddham scripts. And then we have the seven talismans uh, included. And here's another Dharani, how to chant this talisman is also written here. So we know that um, people carry it, right? As I just mentioned earlier, uh, carry this talisman, hoping that all this, you know, talisman activates its power and um, protects the carrier. Um, now we have more talisman, roughly 14 talismans here. I, you do not see 14 all, but basically this is one common place that you've you expect to see uh, Buddhist talismans is inside of uh, Buddhist icons. So Joseon period Buddhism is difficult to study because this was the era people in the you know, previous scholarship and even current some current scholarship believes that Buddhism in this period, Joseon period was severely uh, persecuted. It's true to a certain degree, um, but also as I, tried to show in this today's lecture, Buddhism was very vibrant and it was actually the time period where Buddhism really infiltrated into every corner of the society. Um, but since the official sort of state ideology was Neo-Confucianism, which was very sort of hostile to Buddhist um, doctrines and Buddhist practice, uh, we do not have much um, records, uh, written records or uh, visual records compared to, you know, um, Buddhist Japan or Buddhist China. But these recent years, Buddhist icons became the saviors because inside Joseon uh, Buddhists, they kept a lot of stuff in it. So we have um, now even talismans are, are found intact.
Now we are quickly arriving to 24. So this is a little bit late, um, 19th century, but now you see the complete 24. Usually East Asian text you read from the right to the left. So from here, um, you have 24 talisman, what is four, and then it follows with uh, actual um, uh, seal-shaped uh, talisman. And this one doesn't have name, but I will tell you what it is later. Now, this is a sort of translation of uh, 24. I thought you may be curious about what these are. If you put it together, as you see now, I don't go through everything, but it's quite random. Some you may just scratch your head and is it really Buddhism, Buddhist talisman? So for instance, promotion in career, right? Or something like safe childbirth. Or there is another childbirth talisman um, easily inducing a placenta. Really Buddhists, you know, really cared about, you know, woman delivering a baby. Apparently they did. And actually, so you can think about this talisman as the most wanted or best-selling examples, right? People really concerned about these things. So this is a really interesting lens to you know, see what people were th going through in their minds during the chosen period, right? Or there's another thing called hitting a jackpot that I'm going to introduce in a minute. So here is a uh, same table, but I highlighted seven talismans in yellow because I thought you may want to know sort of the genealogy of these 24 talismans, right? So I cannot go into every detail, but at least this one, this seven has very clear um, source. Um, so this talisman actually comes from another bigger set of talisman uh, circulated independently, 72 talismans. But let me, before I get to that, I like to just show you one example as a sort of case study. So this is talisman uh, called hitting a jackpot. I translated it that way. Um, now that you know, before you go to Las Vegas, which talisman did it that you want to take with you to Las Vegas, right? What is interesting uh, about these seven talismans is all in common, we have this, this sort of interesting line and round shapes right here, 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 all here. These are basically constellations because um, in Chinese, Tao, this, this comes from Chinese Taoist tradition and they were very keen about the macrocosm and microcosm. You are connected to the stars the celestial movement affects or you, you are affected by the, the heavenly movements. So they observe the sky and they created these talismans. So for instance, this one, the total shape one, if you count the, 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 the round shape, they actually seven. So you may have heard the seven stars in the sky, Ursa Major. And this is modified version of seven stars so they kind of make this shape to emphasize this one, the sixth um, star in the seventh, seven talisman, seven um, stars. The, the sixth one called Wu Chi um, star is um, symbolizing the element, metal element. So metal controls, metal, you know, think about metal uh, is, uh, money is made of metal. So money, is basically what is um, communicating with this particular shape. So um, money, therefore, you can, you know, hit the jackpot if you worship this or carry this talisman. So there are other talismans kind of following this similar logic when they create it. I actually wrote about this um, talisman that 72 talismans where the seven talisman come from so if you're interested in more about this where this 72 talisman zhang jai ling fu in chinese or 72 numinous talismans for the stabilization of residences you can learn more if you're interested in from this article so i just leave it here um but also you saw 24 talismans right we now know seven are coming from this taoist very clear Taoist um, 
um, talisman set, but there are some other sort of sources um, that eventually uh, merged into 24. And one big area that I like to mention is Dunhuang. Dunhuang is an area name in China. Um, I'm going to introduce in a minute. And then there are other sort of uh, venues that I couldn't really fu fully um, understand yet, but uh, hopefully more before I publish my book. So in this picture, what you see is two men. I should have made it very clear, but they are not related here, right? It's two different picture. On the left-hand side, you, will, you see Mr. Wang. This is taken um, 1900. Um, this local Taoist master who lived near a um, place called Dunhuang, he accidentally found uh, an entrance point of this massive, massive um, cave has a lot of manuscripts, scrolls, right, are kept. It was sealed close to a uh, thousand years because it was closed around at the turn of 11th century. So very like 900 or almost a thousand years, it was sealed and accidentally found by this person. He then did not know the value of this um, um treasures a lot of, most of these um documents and um scrolls are, are buddhists so was um um overseas scholars including this person paul Pelio, they got very interested in he paul Pelio is one of the renowned sinologists of the time period and people you know flocked into this caves called library cave and they studied a lot of these materials and um the sad part is it kind of kind of um broken pieces into different um different imperial invade invaders uh, french russian japanese and british all took their portion and this is all spread across the globe but thankfully uh, thanks to research collaboration project there is this website where you can see a lot of them are digitized and those are very essential for my talisman study because a lot of korean talismans that um, i'm presenting are also having um, the, um, you know, origins in China. Most of them are you know, ch Chinese origin. And many of them that I'm showing here are from Dunhuang. So P is actually renamed uh, Paul Pelio, right? So uh, Pe uh, Paul Pelio's uh, collection, we usually start with P, Pelio. So Pelio 3874, Pelio 2602, right? All these things, three are definitely coming from, or we know that this, these talismans were very ancient, but also was very popular in China as well. Now, let me go to the ritual use. I'm going to give you some more detailed um, case studies. So um, before we get into the different you know, examples, I'd like to mention that there are three major places you can see, you are expecting to see talismans. In other words, um, talismans were like unlike the everyday use, if it was used for Buddhist ritual uh, contexts, you are very likely um, expecting to see it inside of stupa or funeral rituals. As you saw it um, in the very beginning, it was stamped inside of the coffin. Sometimes I'm going to show you soon, but also people were uh, shroud, right? The, when you die, you do some makeup and then people put up put up some put on some clothes and that's where you also see talismans but also another common place is in Choson period uh is uh this inside of Buddhist statues that we already looked at it and in Korea we call it Bokjang and Bokjang practice was very very popular in Joseon period so the first thing, the um, stupa, is where you you like to, you are very likely to see, but we don't have that many examples. Um, but in this particular example, in example from the 14th century, um, this 
uh, five story stone stupa are currently standing in um, at a temple called Yongjusa Temple. Uh, inside, we have um, these seven talismans. No, is it seven? Um, ten. <laughs> ten talismans, you see that, right? And this talisman is very interesting because it actually appears, not this one, this is actually modern rendering, re remake of it, but this talisman is um, commissioned by this eunuch. Uh, very powerful Kang Gumgang eunuch, who was very powerful eunuch during the Yuan Empire in China. So whenever he has some official mission to Korea, Korean Peninsula, he did a lot of Buddhist um, um, sort of pious activities, like donating um, Buddhist texts or Buddhist um, icons. And this is one example um, of all, one of the earliest examples of these ten talismans. Um, that attached to this Buddhist text called um, Diamond Sutra. So from this Diamond Sutra, um, you just saw, you may have missed, I'm going to replay it. So this uh, orange color ones are coming from, not necessarily coming from, what I like to say is the oldest um, encounter is from that particular example. Now, we have another um, sort of representation of 24 talismans. So very likely to mass produce, people use wood blocks. Um, so what you see here is some decorative diagrams. And then now you are a little bit familiar, right, with the 24 talismans. And at the bottom, you very likely to see the, the names of the donors. Um, so with this kind of wood blocks, what you do is you stamp it right on the coffin. So what you see here is the interior uh, interior of coffin, and you see the talismans and the diagram here, right? And then this is uh, this particular example is coming from um, the tomb of Chong On, another Confucian scholar, an official who lived in this time period, and uh, this is actually his wife's clothes that she probably worn in her, you know, when, um, by the time that Chung Won died. But once her husband died, she wanted to sort of make some karmic connection, whatever. She stamped 18 talisman here and then some decorative diagrams here um, and inserted in the tomb of his, uh, her, her husband. So you see the use of how talismans were used. So now at this point, you may wonder what is the difference between 10, 14, 18? I don't think the first, I thought there must be some important symbolism going on with the numbers, but um, I tentatively conclude that there was no such a significance in terms of the numbers. Um, what is important for them was that the detail, the each Individual talismans were not necessarily important. They were, to a certain degree, like the you know, talisman to guarantee you to reborn in the pure land or get rid of evil karma. Those things are essential. So those things keep repeated. But other than that, the combination is very fluid. So whatever available seems uh, eventually what was made to the, the final product. Here you see a lot of um, other, um, here's another example of a um, little bit later, a, a 17th century example of, now you see why there are so many mummies. Uh, I've, I haven't seen the other, but a lot of mummies in, in Joseon period. The reason being um, 16th, 17th, 16th and 17th centuries, we have several quite uh, examples of uh, mummified corpses were discovered. And thanks to that, um, the condition also preserved papers like this. So in this case, what you see is, is talismans used as a filler, like, you know, to make sure that the body doesn't move too much. And what is interesting about this particular um, style, tomb style, is that they used um, lime clay 
lime, uh, which is one mineral, right, kind of create a very vacuumed space. So it couldn't really air could airtight space so that the corpse often didn't really decay. And we have a lot of these clothes and fillers um, beautifully preserved. So that was a brilliant idea from my research. Um, here is another example that I mentioned earlier. Another major places that you expect to see talismans is Bokjang, or in Korean Bokjang, but in English, enshrinement of sacred uh, objects. A lot of objects were enshrined, but along with a lot of things, we also often see talismans such as this one. So uh, what I like to think about with you guys is what unites these three spaces, stupa, I mentioned, right, and coffin, and also these Buddhist icons, hallowed space of Buddhist icons. And commonly, talismans, numerous set, different combinations, but this uh, set of talismans are found. What I like to um, sort of highlight here is um, while recognizing the ritual goal of depositing object, which is Bokjang, in the Buddhist icon is to consecrate and to animate, which is conceptually the opposite of death. Those talismans deposited in the inner space of the sacred icons functioned the same way as those talismans used to adorn the deceased and the coffin. So similar to the main use of stupa, developed initially as a relically. So stupa, if you are not familiar with what stupa is, it's basically, you saw the five-story stupa, right? It could be stone, could be wood, made of wood, many materials, um, clay was another material, um, whatever. Um, after Right after the death, uh, physical death of the founding figure of Buddhism, Shakyamuni Buddha, Buddhists wanted to remember um, the Buddha's teaching and also himself. So they created this mound, mortuary mound, that is stupa. And inside, what was enshrined is the relics. Basically, after cremate the body of the Buddha, um, some beads like crystal like beads were um, miraculously um, remained. So those were enshrined. So Initially, stupa was basically a death ritual, right? It's a mortuary site. But also at the same time, ironically, it, it talks about death. It signals to death. But at the same time, it is a physical, constant reminder of the presence of the Buddha. So in the later period, in the Indian Buddhism or earlier Buddhism, Buddhist Buddha was sort of historical figure who died, right? Taught 35 years died. But in the later Mahayana Buddhism, he became, he was elevated or he was conceptualized as a cosmic being. So he never died. He just for um, the, you know, uh, love of his um, um, Buddhist, he manifested himself in a physical shape. So erecting stupa meant a physical reminder and also the presence of the Buddha. So it's kind of death and also at the same time life in, in a sense. So anyway, so similar to that, the common use of talisman in the stupa, coffins, and Buddhist statues suggest that the essential function of talismans was to sacralize and shield, to protect um, the mortuary container. So encased and hidden, so all of these, right, uh, stupa, coffin, and these Buddhist icons, all encased and hidden, talismans included in this closed structure uh, were one of the most effective ways to increase its inaccessibility. This inaccessibility and the liminality, um, neither dead or alive, ironically created a cosmic space for talismans to remain activated and augmented. Now I'd like to sort of zoom out a little bit and then give you some broader points to think about Joseon Buddhism. Because as I mentioned in the um, couple of slides ago, Joseon Buddhism has been really understudied. Um, 
because a lot of often cases people are interested in intellectual discourses, but there is a lot of intellectual sort of um, materials uh, between uh, Buddhist masters or neo confucian scholars or some elite Buddhist monks. Not a lot, but there are some treaties or some scholarly works written by, you know, some towering figures. But as I said, I think it's really important to also rescue or reveal the unprivileged or the less privileged people. And I think talisman is really um, one interesting material to show um, that aspects, that uh, understudied aspects of Chosen Buddhism, and in return, we see that how talismans was everywhere, and Buddhism were very much behind of this um, supporting or promoting talismanic culture. So this example um, is also interesting, a little bit late, 19th century, um, example woodblocks, woodblock, and then on the left-hand side, you see the woodblock and the uh, left hand side and then right hand side you see the printing of it right so it's reversed and so now you see this um i don't know whether you see it well here but what is interesting is that the title says in korean or in english the catalog of the eighty thousand buddhist canon taught by the buddha so what is interesting is that in the buddhist circle they want to emphasize that this is what buddha taught Oh, the Buddha never taught in so they are basically not telling the truth but they in the tradition from the very beginning of Chinese talisman they had to divide this rhetoric to make Buddhist talisman Buddhists so that um, this kind of title was often used um, so what is interesting about this particular example is that uh, even the 19th century Chosun period they wanted to make sure that people know that talismans are Buddhist and this is actually what Buddha taught. So here what you see is the all the, not all, but actually some selective texts, the titles of texts. So it's not even 80,000 Buddhist canon. So it's actually false to false claim that this is our catalog, but basically some texts uh, uh, names and how many volumes are here carved. And then we have the, the time and who did that. And then from here to here, we have 24 talismans that we now familiar with. So one of the things that I like to mention is um, we have another lesser known uh, aspects of Buddhist temples in Joseon because um, Buddhism, unlike the previous dynasty, Goryeo dynasty that exists before Joseon, Buddhism, Buddhist temples were basically um, uh, off limits to a lot of women. So basically the, the Joseon era law prohibited women to enter from entering Buddhist temple grounds. Um, because they thought that is the, the Buddhist temples are the, the place of all this moral corruption takes place and Buddhist monks are not um, following the Neo-Confucian uh, moral ethics. So, but what we also have to think about is already during the Korea period, which is the earlier, right? Um, 11th century and then 14th century during this uh, Korea period, what you see on the left here, also this monk is holding this wood block, is called uh, the Tripitaka of Koreana or Buddhist canon. So 11th century, uh, following the J Chinese example, the Korean Buddhists with the you know national support because Korea was uh, very, default uh, Buddhist nation, they sponsored this massive um, woodblock uh, projects to preserve Buddhist texts in uh, this stylographic form. And this, uh, that one, the 11th century was um, basically burnt um, down during the one foreign invasion. So about 100 years and 50 years later, uh, another 
13th century, we have another, this is what you see, so the, the example from the 13th century. So a lot of people in their mind, knowing this history, oh, Buddhist temples, Buddhist temples, some major Buddhist temples in Joseon also mostly functioned as uh, the sort of library repository of these woodblocks that were carved in the previous period. So basically they are library, but we also have to, if you look at the, what materials are preserved other than this major canons, there are other temple, local temple production, um, basically a smaller scale of uh, printing workshop existed in Joseon temples, not every, but a lot of them so that they actually already had accumulated um, skill set to carve these wood blocks. And also often what they carved is Buddhist texts, but also um, as popular as those Buddhist texts, there were also talismans were carved, different talismans. So we have to think about how talismans was also partaking in this, um, this broader um, printing culture in Korean Buddhism. So um, also know that Buddhist temples as the main producer. So we think about who produced these talismans. There are some, you know, non-Buddhist also probably carved and made, but uh, Buddhist temple were the major workshops, major um, main uh, producer of these talismans that we have seen so far. A little bit more of social history. So um, now we know the the production part, what about the circulation, right? And on the left-hand side, you see a very famous uh, Joseon painter whose name was Kim Hongdo, lived in this time period. And he basically is the master of a painting a category called Zhangle painting. So often he his gaze is um, the ordinary people's ordinary things. So here what you see is two Buddhists. One is holding one instrument, the other is holding another instrument, basically attracting people's attention, very likely at, at a marketplace. And you see two women we are not sure whether they are related, they are the same, you know, they are, you know, accompanying each other or not. That's not clear, but what we know is that they are selling something, right? I think this, this could be talismans, but I also think this may not be talismans, but what is very likely from this painting is that Buddhists were uh, very interested in promoting um, Buddhist donations to the people. They go to this. The reason why this is important was that, as I said, Buddhist um, temples were forbidden, right? Although um, in theory, it was forbidden. If you went to Buddhist temples, you the, the criminal law says you get 100 flogging, but if you look at this uh, Joseon official record called um, Joseon Wangjo Shilok, this massive records of day-to-day -day, um, incidents during the Joseon era, there are a lot of uh, mentioning, um, you know, accounts that stop going to the temple, stop going to the temple. So by reading, you know, the uh, between the lines, we know that there are actually, that was law, but actually people kept entering the Buddhist temples and donated and all these things. But this is one example that Buddhist monastics took more proactive role and come down and then sell or go for some fundraising. Another um, social actors that may have they actually, um, there are some records that um, prove the point that instead of monastics, lay performers were loosely, some lay performers loosely associated with Buddhist temples. They actually got Buddhist talismans from the monastic, you know, uh, members, and then they uh, perform um, like different types of, you know, acrobats and dance and mask dances and you know, instruments they perform. And then after their performance ended, um, they sell talismans and they, they, 
get some, you know, the, they give the commission, literally small uh, commissions back to, they return the commissions back to the Buddhist, temp, uh, Buddhist monastic members. So this is one sort of example of this, this group, the, um, the musician performers group who were promoting or selling Buddhist talismans called Sadangpe. So now I think it's time to conclude. Um, um, whether you realized or not, you actually did a little puzzle with me. So this is the completed puzzle. I didn't explain these uh, six ones. So the green ones that I didn't explain, I have here. Um, this the oldest appearance of these green talismans come from this um, collection of Dharani texts called Pamsa Chongjijip. Um, the oldest edition is coming from 11th century. So as I said, the point here here is we have different sort of um, sources or um, groups that eventually merge into this 24. Um, the last one that I also like to mention here is that this purple one. This one is Safe Childbirth Talisman. In my book, actually, I have a one chapter solely dedicated to this particular talisman because apparently I think this was, in terms of um, historical order, this may have been the most ancient one among these. Um, that's my hypothesis, but it has something to do with this uh, very popular deity called Avalokiteshvara. Anyway, so this is coming from another Buddhist text called Crown Dharani Sutra. So combined together, these 24 talisman, talismans functioned as a giant talisman as well as a point of reference. And its complex vision creates uncanny effects, feelings for their viewers and also for the users. And the fluid format allowed the adherer, adherers to interact with individual or multiple talismans curated, curated for different ritual purposes. For um, the conclusion, uh, another conclusion, multiple layers of ambiguities built around talismans, such as tensions between text and image, visibility and eligibility, as well as accessibility and inaccessibility, played a key role in enacting the efficacy and potency of talismans. And that the 24 talismans, and also the 24 talismans occupied a central place in Joseon Buddhist devotional practice. Ultimately, my examples challenge the common view of uh, Joseon Buddhism being dormant and defeated. Rather, these talismans, I think, present surprisingly vibrant and dynamic picture of Joseon Buddhism. Thank you for your attention. And here's my email address if you have any I, I look very forward to our Q&A, but if I couldn't answer all of your questions, feel free to reach out to me and drop a note and we can have uh, continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sujong. That was really interesting to someone who knows so little about the history of Buddhism in Korea. It was very lucid. Um, I'm going to go to, and we have a number of good questions. So um, I'm going to start with one uh, that showed up early, and it's also one I myself had, which is, um, are talismans in Korea tied to Buddhism exclusively? Do, or another way of putting that is, do we have pre-Buddhist talismans in Korea, or did they find their way into Korea by way of um, Buddhism? Um, and also, uh, who else uses talismans do uh, korean christians use talismans or are they viewed with suspicion by um uh, by other groups excellent questions um that actually is a book <laughs> book worthy <laughs> um questions but to give you a brief ideas so korean talismans are off as i said um for the most part sort of following Chinese um, examples and Buddhism also coming from China, right? So that's why I kind of a little bit conflated the two and I know where the question comes from, therefore. So let me a little bit explain the Chinese situation, okay? So a lot of Sinologists, they wanted to understand the history of printing 
and as I said, the paleo, the guy that, you know, in the cave, he well, was the Paul one. Paleo. Actually... Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll come back to Paul Pelio. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Paul Pelio, for instance, he had this question where this printing comes from, the origin, right? And he thought talisman may have some, some clue to tell us more about it. So the oldest um, news of writing also has to do with this um, talisman. So that's so, so this is a fascinating topic, I think. I cannot, I'm just doing various fragment history in Chosun, but as much as I can, I like to tie all this. But basically, the oldest, so scholar, a lot of, a lot of scholars in Sinology, Chinese studies, they have believed that it's from Taoism. Hmm. Um, but Taoism has close tie with Chinese imperial history, which is, we are talking about first century common era, okay? So there was this dynasty called Han Dynasty, which ended around second century CE. And that is sort of when Taoism really takes off and they used a lot of imperial motive and themes in their organizing their religious thoughts. But my, my point is there are another counter uh, arguments like James Robson at Harvard. Um, he wrote very uh, uh, in-depth article, 2008, Signs of Power. And in it, he argues that the oldest Chinese example, like physical um, example of Taoist talisman is sixth century CE, common era. But Buddhist one is fifth century. So there is one century Buddhist earlier. So they already reverts this ah. common notion of Taoist origin, right? Mm -hmm. So what is really complicated here is that it looks like Taoist started, but the example, the, you know, or the, the circumstantial evidence tells Buddhists also had even earlier <laughs> use of talisman. So, so another scholar, uh, Michelle Strickman, he was probably the pioneer, pioneering scholar in this game. And my book titled, Korean magical medicine actually is a homage to his Chinese magical medicine. Ah, okay. And this Michelle Strickman said, this origin question is useless, <laughs> more interesting because it's very difficult to determine who started first, right? So I think that reflects the Korean situation that the, the, the questioner asked about, but because so I will get to that later, but know that this origin, rather than asking the origin question, probably it's more useful to see more broader patterns and the mutual borrowings. That's mm. where the current scholarship stands on. Now, moving to Korean talismans, there are almost zero scholarship. <laughs> I mean, there, it, there is one uh, monograph and a couple of articles, um, but very, very little is understood about Korean talismans because this is actually connected to the next question, this sub-question, who used talismans, right, in Korea? Um, so the, the, the situation between China and Korea different. We did not have institu institutionalized Taoism, but we do, did have Taoist culture, but we do have very strong institutionalized Buddhist presence in Chosun, um, in Korean peninsula from the first century common era all the way to 20, I mean, current time, right? So Buddhism was very uh, positioned well in terms of how, you know, they observe and, you know, carry this scenic culture to Korean peninsula with these Buddhist monks, pilgrimage and merchants and all these things, right, happened through this um, channel. But um, so to come to the Korean situation, so Buddhists used, but also uh, a lot of Korean pre-modern intellectuals used talisman as some sort of you know, gentleman's, you know, knowledge too. You know, you should know, right? Like if somebody is sick, use this talisman, right? If you have diarrhea, use this. So you, so learned men had to learn and it didn't really, they didn't really concern, were concerned with this is Buddhist or Taoist, whatever it worked. They were more pr practical. Also, it was difficult to know the origins of each talismans anyway. Now, scholars like me, I can see which one is the Taoist talisman, which one is Buddhist talisman by the shape and what is written. But um, in the pre-modern time period, that was sort of a question out of question. 
And the second question, whether Christians also use or some other people use. So what is interesting is the for the study of talismans, why people have not looked at talismans, especially in Korea, is also there has been um, sort of sanitization throughout the modern period, because um, we have to understand this um, modernity, how the modernity came to Korean Peninsula it was through Japan, Japanese colonization, which happened in the nine, late um, um, 19th century, early 20th centuries. So throughout that period, people both in China, China, Japan, Korea, all of East Asia or the rest of Asia, they had this um, very um, dual engagement with their past, selective engagement, right? Something um, like talismans is something sort of shaming, you know, it's kind of sp the prime examples of superstitions. So that it was really, even in the scholarship, it was totally marginalized. And the first person actually who studied the Korean talismans was actually a Japanese scholar who basically want to prove the point that, you know, this look at this, how, you know, um, um, backward Koreans were during the Joseon period. So with this kind of um, um, scar or um, sort of um, stigma, talisman was misunderstood uh, as um, sort of um, items used by shamans, like shamanic people, another religion that I didn't talk about, but they also have strong comments on this talismanic culture, or those in between people who do not necessarily belong to any major labeling, labeled religions, but there are other, like, especially blind people, uh, often seen as people who, those blind people, or often engaged with um, sort of healing and uh, divination in Joseon period. So those people were also very active with this kind of um, alternative, I call it, healing or other um, management of uh, everyday crisis. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did, very, very, very much so, very capably. Um, this is going to be a, a more concrete question. Uh, people are wondering about the significance of the red ink on talismans, generally red ink, but more specifically, whether using blood as an ink carries some particular power or mm. That's a good question. Um, actually, I do not know much about the examples from Joseon, but I think from China. Um, but blood is actually, in Buddhism in general, a lot of cases we find people... This is the ultimate devotion, right? You, um, how should I put it? But let me start with a little bit broader picture, right? In East Asia, your bodily parts can be the best medicine. Once it was used as medicine, mm -hmm. <laughs> you may call it carnivalism, <laughs> but it's still, it was early 20th century, Korean newspapers were reporting those quite, uh, you know, cases too, like somebody so-and-so, you know, carved his thigh, you know, meat, not meat, but is it flesh, mm -hmm. and offered that to his mother as a medicine and miraculously mother healed. That kind of, this is long-standing practice already, you know, practiced in medieval China. So that's kind of one big idea about human body using sort of ultimate you know, um, expression of ultimate faith or devotion. And blood is one type of, so I think it's kind of along that line, blood is another, uh, the red being also the color of exorcism in uh, Chinese religion, Chinese belief. Again, similar to the color yellow that I briefly mentioned, the color um, red is the yang, uh, very, you know, bright, um, sort of vibrant and also kind of active energy so that when you use uh, red color in ritual objects, the basically demons do not like it. They, they are scared of red so that they run oh. away. So that's the main sort of theological reason behind because, you know, demons are in and they are very, you know, they have aversion to the bright youngness so that um, red is used that. But also, as I said, there are a lot of uh, occasions in Buddhist 
Buddhist texts, people, there is a, a practice called um, sutra copying. So basically, Buddhism, very interestingly, I mentioned, kind of, I hinted here and there, but printing is very tied with technologies that are tied with Buddhism too, but also because Buddhism promoted this idea of wide circulation of Buddhist teachings. So for that, you needed um, printing, but also if printing is not available, you do manu manually, you transcribe what Buddha yeah. said. So this practice of um, writing, copying sutra has been the one of the most uh, popular devotional practices in entire East Asia. And often, not often, but there are some known cases, because it's some extreme cases, often some pious um, practitioners use their blood to um, transcribe for this text. But the idea is, you know, I would explain the kind of the best offering that you can you can give, right? So that is, I think, okay. one Go one ahead. interesting, one interesting, because I know that this person is interested about the color scheme, but talismans also sometimes use in the space, in the open space. So color is not always, you know, what they are thinking, but it could be written basically any surface in um, not any color, but they had preferred color, which was um, red. Thank you. Uh, I want to read out one comment and then another question, and that depending on how long you respond, that may be that that may be our time. We'll see. But the comment first is from um, my colleague here at the Divinity School, Jacob Alupana. Up oh, there, you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, my colleague uh, Jacob Alupana, Alupana, um, who, as I said, teaches here at the Divinity School. Mm -hmm. uh, he says. Thank you for this brilliant lecture, Professor Kim. As a follow-up to the last question, that was actually two questions ago, he says, it seems that there is a particular worldview that allows this expansive and rich talisman culture to exist. Western culture and imperialism destroyed this in Africa and Latin America and other places. Um, our health system I think he means our, yes, he mean, by our, I think he means, because Jacob is from um, Nigeria, our health system is destroyed by the Western missionaries and imperialism. So um, you're welcome to respond to that comment if you, mm -hmm. if you like, and then I have one more question from, uh, from another person you know well. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for the uh, kind words and then also for your question. Um, yeah, definitely. Certain worldview informed um, this chosen people's use of talismans. And as I mentioned, I just briefly mentioned in answering other questions, this the, all this sort of sort of systematic study of chosen talismans was conducted by this Japanese imperialist with this um, uh, uh, ulterior motive, right? Um, but also interestingly, when I study talismans, because of this in particular, you know, I, I like to sort of localize this Korea's history in the 60s and 70s, Korea rapidly modernized and urbanized. And what happened then was, so as I said at the very beginning, right, if you look at the household of Joseon, you like to see there are talismans in the kitchen, in the toilet, in the threshold, everywhere. But around that 60s and 70s, uh, often talismans were all uh, wiped out, you know, new buildings were um, built and uh, people no longer uh, see it in the public space. What is really funny though is um, during the pandemic, the, the one of the biggest, I think this church is actually listed as um, the world's largest Pentecostal um, church in Seoul and one of the priests there was promoting a talisman, a little card during the pandemic when pandemic was really uh, at, at its pinnacle. Basically he was <laughs> promoting a talisman for his Christian followers. If you have this, you don't get COVID. <laughs> So it's very interesting sort of double standards about yeah. talismans, right? If you have it, it's for your own protection.
but if others have it, it's a superstition. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but <laughs> during the so, but going back to the person's question, during the um, 19th, 18th, 19th centuries, Korea also was exposed to a lot of Western imperial presences, and it was um, a lot of missionaries came in and they actually wrote not a lot but in passing here and there they kind of comments on korean people's use of talismans so it's very unfortunate that you know this imperialism really wiped out and eventually right modernity they they brought is kind of in a way um drove this um thousand years traditional way and put it in a very marginal space so that giving a hard time scholars like me <laughs> but at the same time their records are sort of very valuable for me as a secondary source to understand this you know um what was happening during that time period i'll leave it there okay one last question and it's from matt dylan whom, oh. <laughs> whom you know <laughs> hello uh, matt, matt. Says, matt <laughs> yes. says, I'm really interested in the talismans stamped in coffins. Mm -hmm. I heard you say that they, quote, sacralize and shield the mortu mortuary container. But I wonder what role they played for the deceased. Would, mm -hmm. be would the deceased be protected by, ta uh, by these talismans between death and birth? Were they understood to bring auspicious rebirth in pure land? Or would it help guide the deceased between worlds? Mm. Thank you, Matt, Professor Dylan, for your excellent question. Um, too bad you had a webinar format. I thought it was more like, you know, that's Zoom lecture format. Oh, no, sadly. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we can connect later. Um, so for the question, I think, um, I know where um, Matt's question comes from, but judge, I have I don't I have so many theories. I don't have any you know f uh, definite answer to that. But judging from what talismans were used, right, often, so it's basically getting rid of your bad karma. So it's kind of all encompassing, you know. It I know it's kind of a little bit sounds un unanalytical. But the more I look at examples, people didn't give too much thoughts when they put together different talismans, right? So, uh, but their main concern was that they don't make sure that they don't go, go to the hell and they go to the pure land, which is the, you know, pure land is lower than enlightenment. So they don't aim that high, but their best shot is to, you know, remain in this samsara, but the best possible place is a pure land. So um, I think that's what in their mind, when they, you know, put this uh, stamped, this talisman, um, talismans in the coffin, um, I don't necessarily think this was used for um, sort of guidance. Um, not necessarily this was actually, you know, talismans summon some spirits and spirits actually guiding them from, because in Buddhism, there is this 49 days of uh, sort of limbo period. I, I wonder whether Matt was referring to that, because, you know, that is another sort of theological background where Buddhists devise a lot of rituals, because what the, you know, family members of the deceased can do is to make sure make a lot of offerings of course to the buddhist monastics <laughs> so they can have economic gain <laughs> and all the ritual needs but they think in so there is this um invisible transaction going on right you make offerings during the, that 49 days and then you know you transfer the merits so that that goes invisibly to this deceased person that miraculously erase all this evil karma and then go to the better place there was this idea of this ritual in buddhist ritual so i think you may actually onto something but um i don't know maybe i i'm I, i'm now realizing that i'm rambling a little bit but probably oh, you're answering, it. <laughs> you're answering it um yeah, and Matt is saying uh, he was in fact talking about the the limbo period he uh, 49 days um and you know what would tibetan buddhism would be you know navigating yeah, bardo. Bardo, mm -hmm. 
yes. um, some intermediary realm, whether these talismans aided the deceased in their negotiation of the um, yeah, that's that definitely so there. So that's one thing. But another thing that people in China and Korea do, they use this fake money. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that they visualize when it was deceased person departs the physical body, they go to somewhere, right? And they have to sort of cross this river, this imagined space. And to get to that the other side, they needed some travel money. So they actually put some either coins in the mouth that yeah. person's mouth or yeah Charlie you know a lot too um <laughs> no, no, yeah, I'm just thinking of that I'm thinking of the the Greek example of uh -huh. the coin under the mouth to pay yeah. the, the ferryman yeah. yeah they also put some grains make sure that they are not hungry <laughs> so there are a lot of these thoughts put into in this material form so Telesma may had that role as well but it's not really the problem with uh, studying Telesma is it's all fragmented so I have to put it together and then create a narrative so I haven't gone to that far for this particular question but I will keep thinking about it thank you well thank you thank you Sujong. this thank you for this very rich presentation and and conversation and the, and the Q&A session and thank you all for joining us this evening um, for this, the annual Anne Cook Lecture. Please be on the lookout for future events uh, this semester, uh, many of which we will continue to offer like this as Zoom webinars, uh, which we do in, in no small part to reach as wide an audience as possible. Uh, we've had uh, nearly, um, uh, we had up to 70 people joining this, uh, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so in the meantime, I want to thank you again, Sejong, one last time and bid you all good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thank Have a you. good evening. Sponsors, Center for the Study of World Religions and the Ankuk Fund for Korean Buddhism. Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.